was like uh, $18 for a Budweiser. Yeah. Like, case of those. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, some of this kind of may uh, sort of come as like review because uh -huh. we've been over some of this stuff before. But um, so this is what I want you to do for next time, right? Okay. I'm always going to put the stuff for next time over here. Um, so you're going to be just reading the intro to the, the Gothic section. And then a couple of short excerpts from that section. Um, all told, it's going to end up being about 16 pages. Okay. And you got a week to do it, because we don't meet on Monday. Martin Luther King Day. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, we don't, we don't have a full week until week three. Britishness call to mind for you? Um, if I'm going to be honest, One Direction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a boy band, all yeah. right. <laughs> um, what, like, apart from the fact that they happen to be British, right? Like, right. is there anything about One Direction that like suggests Britishness to you, like? that this is a band that could not exist in any other kind of space? Um, not really, I guess. I don't, I don't think so. OK. Yeah, I feel like it's like, they're pretty generic. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they could easily be American. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Yeah, I don't think so. All right, um, any, so is there anything else yeah. that you think of? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's just the first thing you think. Yeah. Of. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think of history, like. Okay. History of Brit like British. Yeah. Britain. Yeah. And that's then, where that's where all the history comes from. Yes. Yeah. yeah then, um, <laughs> tea. 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 Okay. <laughs> Which, as you probably know, not actually British. Right? Right, right. Tea plants do not grow in Britain. Right. Um, it's uh, something that comes to Britain through colonial trade networks. And prior to the 16th century, no one in Britain had ever drunk a cup of tea. Uh -huh. That's so interesting. Um, I think of like queens, kings, their, their monarchs. Okay, monarchy. I know I'm putting a lot of pressure on you here. No, that's okay. It's not like you're going to call it that. So. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so how much do you know about the way the British government actually works? We mentioned monarchy here, but... Honestly, not a lot. Not a lot at all. Okay. Okay. So what's... What's the legislature in Britain called? Do you know? I feel like I should know. <laughs> if you say it. OK. Um, boy. All right, also the greatest funk band of the 70s, <laughs> right, Parliament. Um, <clears throat> so and Parliament is divided into two houses. Right? We've got the House of Commons. and the House of Lords. The House of Lords is supposed to be the quote unquote upper house and membership is hereditary. So this is where all of those, you know, people who are, you know, descended from knights and lords and baronets and whatnot, um, you know, congregate. Um, but the, the House of Lords hasn't had any real power since the early 20th century. Right. They used to be able to veto anything that came out of the House of Commons, who were supposed to be the representatives of ordinary people. Now, one of the things that we'll discuss is actually how unrepresentative the House of Commons typically was, particularly in the earlier part of the period the class covers. 
But um, in the House of Commons, right, so the leader of the House of Commons, right, the Prime Minister, is the leader of the party that, or the coalition, right, maybe you know, two parties or two or more parties might join together um, if no party has a clear majority, right, that has the most seats in the Commons. So the prime minister um, basically runs the government, sets the agenda, right? The big difference between the British system and our system, right, is that our head of government is a separately elected president. The executive in the British system is a member of parliament who's chosen by his own party. Right, or her, she's chosen by her own party, whichever. Um, and uh, we've had, uh, actually kind of like, last year was a kind of whirlwind year for, uh, for prime ministers, you know. Uh, three in a year, uh, one only lasted about six weeks. Um, there was a, a, one of the, the British tabloid articles when uh, Liz Truss had uh, come up with her new economic plan for Britain, right, which basically, like according to one economist, was she was trying to offer um, a Scandinavian style welfare state um, with American tax rates. Um, you can have one or the other. <laughs> you really can't do <laughs> both. <laughs> um, so they, 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 they put a, a picture of a head of lettuce with googly eyes on the front page. And they said, who will wilt faster, Liz Truss or this head of lettuce? The head of lettuce beat her. <laughs> the head of lettuce lasted longer. Um, but yeah, um, so there are now um, two major parties in the House of Commons, right? There are actually, a, there are probably like about a dozen parties that actually have seats in Parliament, but there are only two that are ever really in contention um, for uh, <clears throat> majority. And right now, those parties are the Conservatives. sometimes called the Tories, who are descended from the old Tory party that we'll talk about in a minute. And the Labour Party, uh, which is a kind of center-left party that grows out of a 19th century group, two 19th century groups called the Fabian Society and the Chartist Movement both of which we'll cover in more detail a little bit later in the semester. Um, now, at the time the course begins, in around the 1760s, you still have two major, like really kind of three major factions in Parliament. Right, in fact, it's kind of in this period that Parliament as we, as we know it as a political force is really emerging. And those factions are the Tories, the Whigs, and the Radicals. So the Tories are the representatives of the traditional feudal aristocracy, right? They're the monarchist party. Um, yeah, they're, they're typically the party that supports whoever the king or queen is. Um, and they are also the party that <clears throat> is made up of and represents the interests of the traditional landowning aristocracy, right? Um, how much do you remember about the British class system? Okay, I will. <laughs> okay, so we'll go over that again in a second, so words like aristocracy will mean more to you. <laughs> okay. Um, the Whigs, the Tories' primary rivals, are the representatives largely of the urban middle class. 
which at the time was rising in power and influence. Right, so these were people who had money, but not lands and titles necessarily. Or at least that, you know, some of the Whigs did, but by and large the people that they spoke for did not. They had money instead. And the radicals, who tended to be the smallest faction for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, um, tended to champion the rights and freedoms of ordinary people. Right, the lower middle classes and the working classes. So what all this means in terms of our class system here, right? So there are four basic social classes, even in contemporary Western Europe, right? It's still, Western European societies are still kind of more generally class bound than American society is, right? So like if I say um, here in this country that I'm middle class, does that actually tell you anything meaningful about me? Not necessarily. Not really, yeah. Like pretty much everybody calls themselves yeah. middle class, right? Yeah. And when we do make kind of classifications of that sort, we usually base it on income, mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> Money doesn't really have a lot to do with the British class system. So these are our four classes. with the aristocracy at the top, right? So when, we're ta we're, when we are talking about aristocracy, we're talking about nobility, who originally generated their wealth through land ownership, right? Right, this old model of wealth that equated land with money. And you know, technically in a you know feudalist system, the monarch owned all of the land and parceled it out to his or her supporters, right? So, you know, congratulations, you know, Lord, what's your nuts? Um, you are now, you know, the Baron of Fifeshire, and you have all of these lands to draw an income from, right? And the purpose of this was uh, essentially for military support, right? Um, the Lord or Baron had to have enough, had to be able to generate enough income uh, to one, um, arm himself as a knight, and two, to uh, levy soldiers. <clears throat> so by the end of the 18th century, um, the aristocracy is waning in wealth and importance. Um, they're being overtaken uh, by a new middle class. And middle class doesn't mean the same thing in Britain that it means here, right? So middle class, as we were talking about with the Whigs here a second ago, right, means generally speaking, wealthy, educated professionals. So doctors, lawyers, bankers, pretty much anybody who we might, who we might call in this country a knowledge worker, right? right? Belongs to the middle class. Now the lower middle class would be primarily uh, people who belong, people who are small business owners. So while a middle class person 
might, you know, say be um, a clerk in a national or international firm. A lower middle class person might be somebody who, um, you know, owns a, owns a pub or a local grocery store um, or some kind of small local business. So they're typically um, less educated, they're not necessarily less wealthy than middle class people. Actual money doesn't really have much to do with these gradations. It's more about who your parents were and what you do for a living. And so by process of elimination, who would the working class be? Or I guess it could obviously also even be like the people who just work. Yeah. But it's not about money, so. Basically, it's the everyone else, right? Right. And there would be a, a large, so working class would be anybody who works for a wage, right? right. Anybody who's simply just like, like paid a wage by their employers, particularly if the work they do is manual rather than intellectual. Um, and you know, there again, like there's a huge gradation of incomes here, right? So a skilled carpenter, for example, who works for someone else might be a lot, you know, might be wealthier even than some small business owners. Um, well, whereas an unskilled laborer um, is just gonna be, you know, kind of scraping what they can yeah. to keep body and soul together, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, again, not really about income here. So, if we're looking at Parliament at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th centuries, right, which of these classes do you think has the most influence politically and why? Probably, I would say, like, the middle class or aristocracy, I guess. But mm -hmm. if aristocracy is coming from, like, that's more like old money, right? Like, like Yeah, I think old money, yeah, yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, it would have to be them because if they're at the top, then people kind of show up with yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, the aristocracy still held the most political influence. Um, and a lot of this had to do with the way parliamentary seats were apportioned, right? So I'm sure that this is a word that you have probably read or heard before. So what's, what is gerrymandering? That I do not know. Okay, <laughs> but you've seen the word. Yes. Okay, so gerrymandering um, is when um, political operatives draw district boundaries to benefit their own side, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, say you say like, you know, the, the GOP controls Georgia, right? So according to the state constitution, they control the redistricting process, right? So what they can do if a court doesn't stop them is draw the, dis the boundaries of electoral districts to maximize the victories on their own side, right? The, the New York State Democratic Party actually tried to do this in 2020 and the courts threw the maps out. Um, because it was, I guess, it was regarded as too egregious a gerrymander, right? But yeah, but like, so this is something that people have been doing as long as there's been electoral politics. Now, the particular way that this was done in the 18th century was through the prevalence of what were called rotten boroughs. And to explain rotten boroughs, one thing we have to think about here is just exactly what percentage 
of British subjects were able to vote around the year 1800. So if you were, like, and, you know, just again, just to, to hazard a guess here, right? <laughs> if we're looking around the year 1800, knowing what we know about British society at that point, about what percentage of people do you think would have been legal to vote? You can probably exclude certain groups right off the bat, right? Right. For example, who can we say we probably know couldn't vote? Women. Yeah, so that would be about 50% of the population right, right there, right? depopulated rural areas where there was maybe one big landowner and he could just send whoever he wanted to parliament because nobody else got a say. <laughs> it's, that's fucked up, right? Yeah. <laughs> but this was, yeah, this was how it worked. Um, so one thing that we see, like because the aristocracy was concentrated in the country and particularly in the south, right, is that the rural south of England was way overrepresented in Parliament, whereas the industrializing north and cities generally tended to be underrepresented, which, uh, you know, that was where the power base of the Whigs was, so that limited their representation, or their, you know, their numbers in Parliament. And you know, the, the radicals were speaking for people. And the Whigs and the Tories couldn't get into shits about by and large, right? Um, so this also means, so when we're looking at Britain, you know, the United Kingdom around the year 1800, you know, remember, we're not just looking at England, right, which I'm gonna you know, draw a very, very crappy map here. Um, so we're not just talking about England. We're also talking about Wales. We're talking about Scotland, which is then kind of like that up here, like a giant hat on top of England. And also, all of Ireland right, would have at that time been part of Britain. Um, now, the only part of Ireland that's still part of Britain are these, this little tiny sliver of the north. The rest of the island's an independent republic. But yeah, at the time, all of Ireland was part of Britain. So England and Wales were way overrepresented in Parliament. Whereas Scotland and Ireland, um, which tended to be religiously different as well, had uh, very little representation, right? So religion is probably the next logical place to shift to here. Right? So, do you know like what the official state church of the United Kingdom is? It's a relatively easy name to guess. Scared to guess. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be like the no? I, it's not Catholic, is it? It is ab yeah, assuredly not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's the Church of England or the Anglican Church, right? Okay. 
and like because this was a state church, um, you know, the the monarch was regarded as the head of the church. So whoever the king or queen was was also you know the yeah, the leader of the Anglican Church. Um, this was the church that was established so that Henry VIII could divorce Catherine of Aragon and Mary Anne Boleyn back in the 16th century. So <clears throat> pretty much what this means is that the church was also kind of part of the state bureaucracy, right? It's a government agency as well as a religion. Um, and anybody who was not an Anglican, not a practicing Anglican, was largely excluded uh, from government. For example, um, Catholics and what were called dissenting Protestants could not serve in Parliament. I mean, legally they could. There was nothing stopping them. But in order to serve in Parliament, they had to take an oath that acknowledged the King or Queen of England as the head of church and state. And if you're a, you know, a faithful Catholic or a member of one of these dissenting Protestant traditions, you're not going to do that. So it was a kind of backhanded way of excluding religious minorities from serving in Parliament. Now, dissenter basically means any non-Anglican Protestant. So Methodists, Quakers, Baptists, Presbyterians, right? Presbyterian, most people in the lowlands of Scotland would have been Presbyterians, for example. Um, and in Ireland, in the highlands of Scotland, the majority of people were Catholic. So, <clears throat> Catholics in particular tend to occupy a kind of scary place in the British imagination of the 18th and 19th centuries. And there are actually reasons for this. So, in 1688, King James II, who as king, is supposed to be head of the Church of England, right? right? So, you know, the whole state religious apparatus is supposed to be taking its cue from him. Um, but James, long suspected of being a Catholic sympathizer, um, pretty much wears his Catholicism openly on his sleeve when he becomes king. And in addition to creating a problem for British Anglicans, James is also kind of a shitty king, right? He's just not that good at the job. And so in 1688, the so-called Glorious Revolution replaces James with his daughter Mary who is on the throne from 1689 to 94, right, her death. And her husband, William. And William rules from 1689 until 1701, his death. And they call this a revolution. So revolution doesn't mean the same thing now that it did in 1688, right? So what does the word revolution mean to you now? What do you think of when you think of a revolution? Um, I think of a big, big change, a big cause. Mm -hmm. um, people coming together, kind of a, almost like a rebellion. Okay, so yeah, it means something more like a mass rebellion now, right? 
1688, it meant more something more like a return to normal. Right, so it was called the Glorious Revolution, not because they're overthrowing the king and replacing him with somebody else, right? It was like, we're getting this aberration out here, right? We're getting rid of this, you know, this deviation from the normal and replacing him with something normal. But the other thing that this means is that for the rest of the 18th century, James and his descendants are still out there in Catholic Europe, perhaps gathering recruits to their cause. And they could come back with an invading force at any time, right? So there's a great deal of paranoia. In fact, at a certain in the, in the 1740s, they do. Uh, James is grandson, I think, tries to lead an army down through Scotland. And they're stopped pretty early. They're not very successful. Um, but um, in fact, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Outlander books or the Outlander TV series. <laughs> okay. My, my wife is obsessed with it. So. But yeah, like the early parts that take place during this rebellion in Scotland. Um, but yeah, so there is this fear of Catholic invaders who are ready to pounce and put their guy back on the throne at any moment, right? Now, the other thing that leads to a kind of paranoia about Catholicism in Britain, and this is all going to be relevant to the Gothic stuff for next time, what if, if you stand on the southeast coast, of England on a clear day, what can you see across the water? What country is lying over there? <laughs> I don't even kind of try this because my geography is horrible. Think wine and cheese and all. Oh, oh. right over here. And France, from the 17th through the 19th centuries, was Britain's great geopolitical rival, right? And France was predominantly Catholic. So, in fact, you know, France was Catholic largely in the way that England was Anglican, right? The church was very much intertwined with the state. Um, so, Catholics running around in England might be French agents. And the French were helping these naughty descendants of James II to try to get them you know, back on the throne. So, lots of religious paranoia here, right? And the whole thing about dissenters is just a kind of general suspicion of anybody who's not willing to conform to um, <clears throat> state religious practices. Right? The dissenters have their own thing going, and you know, the Anglican authorities look askance at that. So one thing that we'll find when we're looking at, um, say, like abolitionist movements and things like that in Britain. Um, is that these often have their origins in these dissenting faiths, right? They're the, the dissenters are the ones who are more likely to be supporting these movements. Um, but they often, because they can't serve in parliament without taking that oath that they won't take, um, they often don't have the numbers or the power um, to actually get much traction, which is one of the reasons why reform is so slow. Okay, let's see. Um, other things that I wanted to make sure that we cover here. Okay, so the other big reality of British life in this period, right, is that Britain is a growing and expanding empire. 
So if we're looking at around, say, the year 1760, what territories outside of the United Kingdom, right, would be part of this British Empire? So we've got the North American colonies, right? So we've got... Right, both the future U.S. and Canada, right? So much of North America is under British control. What about, you know, say, islands that might be kind of within the orbit of North America? <laughs> I don't know why, yes. <laughs> um, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> much, much of the Caribbean was also, the West Indies would also have been. That's wrong. In the British sphere of influence, right? Australia. And where does tea come from? or like British has control, like it's British control? It's complicated. Um, so in the Americas and Australia certainly, right? Yeah. What we have are plantation operations. We've got British settlers right. who come in and um, plant themselves in these colonies. Um, some using slave labor, some not. Although, um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize about the U.S. colonies is that um, prior to about the year 1780, slavery was legal in all of them. Right? It wasn't limited to the South. It was less common in most of the northern colonies because there wasn't as much large-scale agriculture. Um, but it was legal. I and mean, I think it was you know, legal in New Jersey until I think like the 1830s. Um, so, yeah, not just limited to a certain part of the country. Um, but yeah, slave labor was, in, was incredibly prevalent in the West Indies, right? Which was valued mostly for production of sugar cane. India was not directly ruled by Britain, but was run by a corporation, or parts of it were run by a corporation called the East India Company. Now, a lot of these shareholders in the East India Company were people who were important in the British government, or who were important, you know, wealthy philanthropists or cultural figures, things like that, right? So, uh, they were primarily trading in tea. In fact, it was East India Company ships that the Sons of Liberty raided at the Boston Tea Party um, and you know, threw the tea into the sea to protest um, a, it was actually, they were actually protesting a corporate tax cut that gave the East India Company a monopoly on tea in the colonies um, by just making it too expensive for anybody else. <clears throat> to participate. But yeah, India was a big source of British economic power. And the East India Company and a kind of sister company called the Royal Africa Company, both of which we'll talk more about 
um, in later sessions. are the big drivers of British economic power. And so they're trading in primarily tea, sugar, spices, and can you guess number four? Tobacco? Not as much. It's another S word. Yeah, that's a big part of the foundation of late 18th century British economic power is the Royal Africa Company's uh, participation in the slave trade, yeah. Um, and one thing that we do want to keep in mind here is that um, the relationship between Britain and Africa at this point is a trade relationship. It's not a colonial relationship until close to the end of the 19th century when they started snapping up territories um, in Africa. Right now, um, they're, just, they're buying spices and exotic woods and slaves from Africa. Okay, so, do you have any questions about anything so far? Because I know I've hit you with a lot of information here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it might be a good idea. To, it, might, it might be a good idea to just step back and take a deep yeah. breath before continuing and see if there's anything that is confusing. Nothing confusing. Okay. Yeah. All right. At least we're doing that part of our job. Good. <laughs> Just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of history. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot, yeah. And I mean, and the reason we do this, or the reason I give you this much history at the outset is because I do think it may, helps a lot of the things we're gonna be reading, some of which are gonna be difficult, make a little more sense, yeah, right? And it will give, yeah, it'll give you vocabulary to talk about some of these things. Um, and it'll also help you to recognize certain cultural trends. Right that are gonna pop up in these texts, right? So for example, you know, the hostility towards Catholicism that you're gonna see in some of the Gothic texts, right? Now you know where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> one more thing <laughs> I'm gonna hit you with. <laughs> and then, um, I'll give you the reading questions for next time and I'll let you go, okay? okay? All right. So the period in literary history in which we're starting, and you know, we'll just talk a little bit about lit periodization of literary history and some of its problems here in a second. So we generally call the period from 1700 to 1745 the Augustan age for two reasons, right? One, uh, because Augustus is the Latin form of George, and the kings during this period were mostly Georges. Um, and also, because there was a conscious attempt on the part of several writers to imitate uh, Roman literature of the early empire period, the reign of Augustus. We call the period from 1745 to 1785 the age of sensibility. We'll be talking more about sensibility uh, in future sessions. The period from 1785 to 1832 is the Romantic period. From 1832 to 1901, right, the big honk and span of years, is the Victorian period. From 1901 to roughly 1945, the modern period. And from 1945 to the present, more or less, we call postmodern or contemporary. And 
these apply just to, to British literature. American literature has its own mm -hmm. classifications. But can you see any problems with kind of breaking up literary history in this way? Um. I would say that it kind of like is isolating each period as its own thing when in reality it's just a different version of kind of what it was before. Not even a different version, but it's just like yeah. more evolved. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, 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 th I think I think that's that's I think that's smart. Yeah, that we they're like the, it's treating these like they're kind of like hermetically sealed jars, right? Yeah. Where something changes in 1745 and everything's different, yeah. right? Whereas you know what happened to all those old Augustan writers who were writing before 1745? Or do they all just die or stop writing or change their style? Like no, yeah. they're still there, right? They're still there and they're still writing. Um, you know, William Wordsworth, the you know big guy in the Romantic period um, is still alive and writing well into the Victorian period. Now, a lot of the stuff he's writing by that point is shit. But, you know, he, but he's still there, right? Yeah. He's still writing. Um, so these dates that we choose are kind of largely arbitrary, right? right. Now, what, el what else does it suggest about each era here if we just kind of pick this one kind of characteristic to focus on? To define the period. What does that suggest about what everybody must be doing? Like if I say that Augustine writing is this, this, and this. Right. Well, I would say that everybody's doing the same thing. It would suggest everybody's following the same yeah. patterns and doing the same things, right? Which, as we're going to you know, see when we look at the Gothic next time, they're not. Right? So what this does, right, what this kind of model does is it kind of forces this model that critics come up with by looking at a few texts right. by authors that might be kind of like part of a particular group um, that is, you know, maybe dominant in society um, at a particular period and suggesting that the features of these texts are what defines the period. Right. And that eh, all this other shit people are doing maybe doesn't really matter that much. So like <clears throat> at the time that the Gothic is popular, right? It's popular, right, all capital letters, right? Like it's popular in both senses, right? One, lots of people are reading it, and two, ordinary people mm -hmm. are reading it. And they're not reading, you know, like the poems of John Dryden or Alexander Pope, right? They're not reading this kind of more rarefied um, literary stuff that is often used to define the period. So when we define periods in this way, we tend to overemphasize the stuff that professors and critics like and underemphasize the stuff people were actually reading. So one of the things I do want to focus on in this course is the stuff that people actually were reading and consuming, right? We're going to do all of the snob stuff too, right? Or at least the most important of the snob stuff. But, you know, I want to pair that with a lot of the more popular writing from the period as well so that we were not getting a one-sided picture. Now that said, the Augustan age and the reason I'm giving you these characteristics as you can, you can compare them to what you read in the Gothic for next time. It is usually described by critics as uh, you know having these particular characteristics. Right, one, the biggest, most important feature is the imitation of Greek and Roman models even in grammar, right? Like most of the bullshit grammar rules that you learn in high school come from this period as writers are trying to make English more like Latin. Like the whole thing about not being able to split an infinitive. Well, of course you can't split an infinitive in Latin because an infinitive is only one fucking word, right? In English though, you know, it's, you know, say, you know, 
Um, <clears throat> so in Latin, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's amare is the infinitive form of the verb to love, right? But in English, it's to love, it's two words. You can absolutely stick something in the middle there. It's, there's no reason you can't. But we tell, we tell students today that they can't split infinitive because the Romans didn't do it. Even though prior to the 18th century, people did it in English all the time. So there's this imitation of Greek and Roman models. So if the Greeks and Romans didn't do it, if it wasn't a genre that they worked in, um, then it doesn't exist. Subject matter is usually urban and sophisticated, right? The pose that an Augustine writer tends to take um, is of a witty city sophisticated. There's a great emphasis placed on the notion of decorum, right? That is, that the form of the poem and its subject matter need to match. Indeed, balance and moderation are kind of the key artistic watchwords of Augustan literature. As is the notion that art isn't something that comes from you know, it's not something that comes from your soul when you're inspired by a vision to express yourself, right? It's a craft that you can learn. And if you learn the rules of poetry and can apply them, congratulations, you're a poet, right? It's something that takes learning and practice rather than vision and inspiration. And finally, there's no tolerance for magic or superstition. Right? No angels or devils, no wizards, no spells, no fairies, right? None of that. Um, occasionally, various Greek or Roman gods may make an appearance, um, but that's okay because the Greeks and Romans did that too, right? But on the whole, yeah, there's no supernaturalism in um, Augustan literature, it's, or at least in mainstream Augustan literature, right? It's kind of banished to the margins. And what we're going to be looking at next time with the Gothic is one of those margins that this stuff gets banished to. Okay. So, that is all I have for you today. <laughs> I think we're uh, finishing up slightly early because we didn't have to go over the syllabus. Um, do you have any questions at all for me? I don't think so. Okay. Then let me give you the guide questions for next time. And like, if there's only going to be one student in this class, like, I'm glad it's you. It's, it's someone I already know. <laughs> yeah, that is good. I was like just thinking about that. I was like, it was like some like shy, like super quiet mm -hmm. person that would be kind of hard. Okay. What is the picture of the review of the monk? Uh, that is, uh, oh, the, 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 the Coleridge stuff is all together. So that starts in 533. Okay. And then the biographical ends on page 537. It's just, okay. it's all part of the same little chunk. Thank you.